welcome to the show everyone thank you for joining us due to few weather issues we could not broadcast the moon but we will we have a lot to keep you interacted by chance if the sky is clear the broadcast will start immediately thank you start the program we'll start the program in 5 minutes thank you hi i uh, hope i am audible to you uh, we'll be beginning in a few minutes uh, the weather has been very bad and hardly the moon is visible but we have a lot of things packed up for you uh, for you to learn understand uh, about eclipses about uh, craters about imaging the moon if you're interested in photographing so uh, we'll begin in a in a while in, in exactly 2 minutes from now okay? just please bear with us we'll start and if by chance the moon shows up out of nowhere the clouds open up there's a small window for us to observe we we'll immediately show you the moonlight okay so for us just wait for a couple of more minutes before we start
Okay, so uh, thank you for being patient with us. We'll be starting now. And we have uh, our Mango Astronomy Club, uh, very senior member, Lohit, who's currently uh, in his uh, 11th grade. He's going to be welcoming the night. So even though the moon is invisible, let us celebrate our moon anyway. And uh, Lohit, up to you. You can start your session, yes. Lohit, his screen is loading. So uh, yes, once you're ready, Lohit, you can start. Hi humans, I'm here to talk about the moon. I'm here in front of you to talk about the moon. The moon, uh, well, it has been, uh, been with us for a really long time. And before I continue on, I'll just introduce you to the moon. People, this is the moon and moon, this is the people. So let's get on. Um, the moon has been traveling with the earth for several billions of years. And with the emergence of humans, it has been, an, uh, like, it has been subjected to several myths and many more things. And uh, the moon has uh, also been subject to a lot of science after uh, the presence of a person named Galileo, an astronomer and the father of the modern astronomy. And uh, to, to, uh, before we talk about him, let's go to uh, Galileo. This is Galileo. Uh, he was an, a, famous scientist, a famous astronomer from the 16th century, I mean, from the 15th century. And uh, he was uh, one of the uh, greatest astron astronomers of all time. And he just fathered the modern astronomy. He was the inventor of the telescope and he uh, dis uh, discovered a lot of craters and stuff on moon and he also made a similarity between moon and the earth and which was uh, not uh, known at that time. Um, people thought moon was some total different realm than earth and he like uh, established similarities and he uh, fathered the modern astronomy and modern understanding of the moon. Following him came uh, Newton. Newton has well like the year Galileo died was Newton's birth, and uh, Newton carried on uh, carried off on his uh, spirit, and he just uh, like found out another similarity between Moon and the Earth. Uh, the force that pulls the people on Earth towards the ground is the same as the force that pulls the Moon towards the Earth, and this similarity was an important thing that helped in a lot of modern physics and uh, so on. So let's go on. Uh, there are many more things that are uh, that have come across the understanding of uh, humans and the moon. So uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can better read on uh, read on this paper. And this paper is uh, simple worded and it is uh, really like famous. And uh, it'll be posted in the description soon. And uh, the next one is why do we like? What's the reason for us to study about the moon and observe it? Well, the main reason is that it is our home. It is the next home. Well, we have when we are going to a new home, we gotta know about what about the new home, and we gotta like understand about it. And thus, we need to like study about the moon before we go go there. And also, it is the museum of the solar system. You might be like, wait, what? Like museum of the solar system? Well, yes, I did mean it. Museum of the solar system. Uh, since uh, the moon is a like very serene place, there's no much. Uh, a flow of water or atmosphere or any disturbances over there. Uh, all the things that attacked it during the earlier parts of earlier times of the solar system still remain as such as it is. So we can get a lot of information of our solar system from that. And, it, uh, and the next reason why it is important is it is interesting. We got to study the moon because it is interesting. It'll just uh, bring on new and new topics and like just keep on our curiosity burning. And what is so interesting about it? Well, can water exist on it is an important question. 
And why can we only see one face of the moon? How was the moon formed? Uh, there are more mysteries around the moon. Let's begin with, can water exist on it? And like, well, let's begin with the origin, first of all. So how was the moon formed? The Thea impact. So the Thea impact was the major, uh, uh, like ma a major theory that uh, uh, says how the moon was formed. Uh, Thea is another planet that was uh, formed along with, uh, the, uh, that was uh, formed during the early parts of, uh, early times of solar system. So this planet, which was mass, mass sized, just came and hit Earth and there was a collision. And you know, when things collide, there'll be a lot of particles created, a lot of debris created. So the, uh, these debris just orbited uh, planet Earth for a lot of time. And they slowly uh, started to clump around and they formed the uh, moon. And thus we got the beautiful moon that we have right now. And uh, the next part, uh, like lunar water. So how can water exist on moon? Well, as liquid, it is difficult for uh, water to exist on moon uh, due to the reason that it's very hot during the days. And also there's a very little pressure. Uh, on an average uh, lunar day, it, uh, temperatures can get up to 127 degrees Celsius. And uh, during lunar nights, it can get to like negative uh, 290 degrees Celsius too, uh, like in the shady parts. And also uh, the lunar water, like, so water can, can't exist as liquid. So what is the other, uh, other way? Well, water exists as tiny, like scattered out uh, chunks, uh, which exist in, uh, throughout the surface of the moon. And also another uh, way water, uh, like lunar uh, water can exist is in the form of lunar water bottles. Yes, I did mean it, lunar water bottles. How is lunar water bottles possible? Like, did we bring, uh, did we take uh, water bottles with us to moon or something? Well, no. Water, bottle well, water bottles were formed in the moon during the early parts again. That's because uh, there was like volcano, there were volcanoes on the moon and unlike volcanoes on earth, these volcanoes actually spewed out glass and water. So these uh, glass molecules, these glass, uh, this liquid gla gas, glass, um, just clumped around the water molecules present, uh, present on the moon and formed lunar water bottles. And the other form how water can exist on uh, moon is in the form of lunar ice. They were like, uh, there were, uh, there are a lot of lunar ice present in the uh, moon and the, especially in the southern parts and the northern parts where there are a lot of uh, shady parts which don't get exposed to the sun at all. So these parts can get as cold as minus 240 degrees Celsius. And this uh, temperature is uh, enough for uh, water to just like freeze around, in, free, free freeze in the moon, freeze on the moon. And uh, this lunar ice was actually found by ISRO's, uh, uh, ISRO's Chandrayaan-1 uh, satellite that carried along with it the moon mineral mineralogy mapper uh, probe that was uh, part of NASA's contribution to the Chandrayaan 1. And uh, using this, they found out that there, were, there was ice on moon. But however, they were not sure whether that ice was actually water itself or a uh, twin of water known as the hydroxyl. Uh, so what they did was uh, they used then uh, an observatory known as SOFIA. Uh, which uh, which is also which runs in the stratosphere. So this flight carries a uh, telescope uh, on, uh, behind it, and it just flies in the strat stratosphere. That is in a higher part in the atmosphere. So this uh, flight actually, uh, this telescope uh, monitored on uh, monitored the um, water on uh, the ice on the moon, and it also found out that it was actually water and not hydroxyl. Um, and what are the other things that we have found, and what have what we have done new? Well, we have uh, found that there are moon quakes on the moon uh, and uh, Buzz Aldrin was one of the first to set up the seismographs on the moon, seismometers on the moon and also achievements. What achievements can have we done? Uh, growing plants on the moon. That's the main, main achievement like, uh, the, of the uh, 21st century uh, where uh, China's Changi 4 uh, uh, lander, just a rover, had uh, saplings on it, and it just grew these uh, cotton saplings over the course of 14 days. After which uh, there was a total uh, darkness, and it was uh, the plants died, unfortunately. Uh, however, that was that's a great feat that uh, human humankind has achieved in the recent uh, decades. And moonwalk, the moonwalk is uh, like you know everybody knows moonwalk, and I'm not talking about the moonwalk of Michael Jackson. Uh, this moonwalk was actually done when Michael Jackson was 10 years old. And uh, this was done by uh, and Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, as you know. 
and this was done in 1969 he'll be like is 1969 very recent to you well yes it is recent when compared to the thousands of uh, years that we are uh, that humans have journeyed with the moon this is a very new thing a very uh, recent thing that we have done 50 years is a very short time when compared to these thousand years and it's a millennia long quest that we had we were, have had with the moon and thus yes this is a very recent feat uh, this shows how very small and how very fast has been our uh, a journey with the moon and now let's carry on why we have we are celebrating this day this day is uh, celebrated because um, of like in order to celebrate all these uh, uh, achievements we have uh, done across uh, these fine like thousands of years and uh, this day is actually organized by uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter mission um, of nasa in order to celebrate all these achievements and uh, also how we have transformed from mythology and uh, beliefs to science and practicality and truth thank you thank you for this speech lohit now sanjana will carry on to explain how craters on the moon work Hi everyone, I'm Sanjana and today I'm going to be talking about craters. So what do you think will happen if an asteroid or a meteor hits the earth? It will form a crater. A crater is basically a circular kind of hole that occurs from impact on the surface. But then that doesn't seem to be happening on the earth. Why? Because earth has an atmosphere and when meteors, asteroids or comets enter earth, they burn up on the atmosphere and don't have a chance to get in. but unlike earth the moon has no atmospheres so all kind of asteroids and meteors fall on the moon's surface leaving various craters of different shapes and sizes but craters don't only occur from large ob objects that hit the moon but also volcanic eruptions so basically when volcanoes erupt rocks and other materials shoot out and make a lot of craters but when the volcanoes demolish from from the inside it forms a caldera they are similar to craters but much larger much larger the already existent craters on the earth are probably really really old or from volcanoes so let's talk more about impact craters so when large objects enter at a high speed the surface gets hit with so much pressure that the rocks pulverize but as soon as they hit the pulverized rocks shoot back up and form a crater while most of the materials falls around the rim Now I'm going to tell you about some famous craters on the moon. Tycho crater. It is 35 kilometers in diameter and it is 108 million years old and it is also located in the southern lunar highlands. The South Pole Aitken base. It is 2500 kilometers in diameter and 6.2 to 8.2 kilometers deep. And now one of the largest old, oldest and deepest craters. Copernicus. It is 800 million years old. and 3 kilometers in diameter it was sampled by the apollo 12 bailey it was 303 kilometers in diameter and finally aristarchus the brightest crater ever 42 kilometers in diameter and 100 to 900 million years old now that you know a lot about craters why don't you go count them thank you
In the meantime, uh, you, you guys can see the craters on the moon up close. You can just see how many of them are there in, in these images that you see on the screen. Uh, you, you can see the dark spots uh, in this crater. It's just a shadow of one part of the you know, a crater falling inside and the other part is lit. And you, you see so many craters around the edge. And I'll, in this particular image that I've shared you now, you can see even more craters, uh, which is not what usually you would find uh, when you're seeing it with your naked eye, but probably with a small binocular or a telescope, you see so many of them. And all of them, you know, like Sanjana explained, the impact craters and different kinds of craters that are formed. And they're so, the moon is full of it. And uh, it's another image where you can see along the line that divides day and night, uh, even more, a uh, lot of craters again. And this uh, particular image that I'm uh, uh, showing you right now is that of uh, the Tycho crater. I hope you guys can see it. And which uh, I think Sanjana spoke in the beginning. Uh, uh, Tycho, uh, by the way, is a very famous astronomer, the one who made uh, a several severe contribution in terms of uh, the data of uh, certain planets like Mars, which would eventually help uh, scientists like Kepler. Again, there are other craters named after him as well. So, so Tycho being one of the most important astronomers in the history of, uh, of uh, the astronomy uh, a subject. So uh, this crater is uh, named after him to honor him. And you see, it's a beautiful crater as you can see on the screen. So now I think we have Akshich. Um, uh, Akshit, I made you the co-host, and now you can share your screen and start your uh, Apollo missions. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, um... Today, I'm going to talk about the Apollo missions. Um, most of you have heard about, and as Lohit mentioned, uh, the Apollo missions in the previous uh, presentation. The Apollo missions are one of the most famous and uh, most daring uh, adventures by man to date. Uh, it, it, sets, it, it sparks all the um, uh, innovations and technologies and uh, everything else which had been done today. So why the fascination with the moon? So mankind has always had a special interest with the moon. As you can see here uh, in the first, uh, first picture, the, that is not a horse. That is actually a lunar calendar, which was made around 15,000 years ago. So it's, it's pretty clear. And it's one of the first uh, evidences of man talking about the moon. Um, and, it's one of, and it's pretty clear from this that man has always had a special connection with the moon. And that mystery and that mystique which the moon has had eventually became into a godlike status. You can see the Sumerian civilizations had uh, had also depicted the moon as a god. They were the first civilization to depict the moon as a god. Um, and the Egyptians also had their uh, moon god Khonsu. And I think the most famous moon god, which all of us know, is Artemis, the, uh, the goddess of hunting and the moon uh, by the Greeks. So mankind, it's safe to say, has always had and a mythical or a mystical uh, connection with the moon. But now, in the 16th century, like, uh, like Lohit mentioned, things took a different turn when uh, scientist uh, Galileo Galilei, he started to observe the moon from a purely scientific point of view. He started to observe the craters, and he was the first one to mention that the moon may not be perfectly smooth, and it may have uh, physical features like the Earth. It may have mountains and valleys and different stuff like that. He observed it using his telescope, which you can see in the images. And slowly, that scientific interest in the moon started to grow even more, and more and more science fiction novels uh, started to be published. The first science fiction novel, which, uh, de which described about a human mission to the moon, was Jules Verne's To the Moon. But the most popular is H.G. Wells, The First Man on the Moon. And then World War I and II came brought, uh, brought along. And when those two started breaking out, the interest in rocketry grew, not for the purpose of scientific advancement, but, the, but for the for military advancement. But it also had a secondary purpose. The rocketry science, which was developed to destroy human beings, now was, is now used to propel human beings to a different planet. And that started the space race. In the 1950s, 
the US and the Soviet Union had a race to see who would reach the moon first. The, uh, the Soviet Union started winning in the first person to reach uh, space. Yuri Gagarin, the first woman to reach space, the first living thing to reach space with Laika the dog. And they, were, they also had the first uh, landing mission on the moon. They first had the rover on the moon, which was the Luna 1. So it seemed like the Soviet Union would soon put a man on the moon. But we'll see that that was not the case. It was the vision and the mission of one man, John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, who swore that, uh, that the US would put a man on the moon within the end of the decade. And that he did. Unfortunately, he was not able to see his achievements completed as he died in 1963 uh, with an assassination attempt. Now let's talk about the Apollo missions. The Apollo missions 1, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So these are all the main Apollo missions which we are going to discuss about today. So let's start with the beginning. Apollo mission, Apollo 1. Like any, uh, like any event, it was supposed to go as according to plan. But unfortunately, it was a tragedy. Apollo 1 was uh, set out to be the first mission uh, of the United States with the particular aim of reaching the moon. The astronauts were uh, all set to be the first to land on the moon. But it also proved uh, a major logistical and an engineering flaw in their system. The Apollo 1 uh, capsule was made uh, was made in an atmosphere made of 100% oxygen. And as we all know, oxygen is a highly, it helps in combustion. It aids a lot in combustion. So when there was an electrical fire during one of the escape hatch uh, test missions, this was not even the final run, mind you. When there was a, an electrical fire in one of the escape hatch, um, when they were testing the escape hatch for safety, unfortunately, because of the 100% oxygen atmosphere inside the, uh, inside the, um, uh, inside the spacecraft, the um, the astronauts, all three astronauts, died. Roger Chaffee and other uh, uh, Roger Chaffee was was the, it was the first time he was ever going to go to space, and he was training. He was killed on his uh, maiden attempt. So this this is the uh, these are the pictures of the ruins that follow. Now, you must have all heard of Saturn V, the mammoth rocket that put man on the moon. But it was actually a big gamble by the United States to use this rocket, as it, the size of it was simply unprecedented. It was 110 meters tall. To put that into perspective, it's taller than the Statue of Liberty. Here you can see a human on the right side. Here you can see a human is, all, is just barely as tall as one of the thrusters in that rocket. So it is truly massive. It could provide around th uh, 35,000 newtons, newton meters of thrust, which was enough to propel 1,684,000 kgs of uh, uh, cargo into orbit, uh, orbit around the Earth, and around 50,000 uh, kgs of cargo into orbit around the Moon. So this was and still is the most powerful rocket to date. Such a rocket has not been made by man even today, even after all the technological advancements of the 20th, of the 21st century. But that the, the main thing about this and the main thing which set it apart is this, uh, this rocket had a processing power of uh, which was less than the modern smartphones which we have today. This, uh, this uh, rocket has less power than the latest iPhone which came out. The iPhone has 12 million times the processing power of this rocket. And I use it to play Candy Crush or um, Angry Birds while this put a man on the moon. So the, the power of this rocket is truly remarkable. Now let's talk about the actual module, about the actual spacecraft which brought man on the moon. It was divided mainly into three sections, the command module, the service module, and the lunar module. So the command module is where the astronauts sit. The service module carries the fuel for the entire mission, the fuel uh, and the oxygen and the hydrogen required to combust the fuel. So the lunar module is the one which eventually sets, uh, eventually lands on the moon. So this is how uh, it is when, when the rocket is about to launch. It is all stored inside this, inside the top, part, top half of the rocket, which is called the fairing. And as soon as it is in orbit around the Earth, the command module and the service modules, which the command module is a triangular part, 
and the service module is the one with the booster and the uh, lunar module is the um, is a spacecraft kind of thing which uh, which is connected to the triangular part so as soon as it as soon as the rocket has entered earth's orbit uh, the lunar module the, the lunar module and the uh, attaches to the command module and they are they are now separated entirely from the saturn 5 rocket and are free to go about the journey to the earth now we will we, we shall now talk about apollo 8 apollo 7 now uh, has had demonstrated apollo 8, 7 came before apollo 8 and it had demonstrated uh, the usa's capability to launch the saturn 5 and put uh, uh, put man into orbit around the earth using the saturn 5 now they were prepared to take it one step further. They wanted to orbit around the moon. And for the first time ever in 1966, uh, Apollo 8 launched, man, uh, Apollo 8 mission launched man outside Earth's orbit and into another extraterrestrial body's orbit that is around the moon. That was the first time man, uh, any living being had gone outside Earth's, um, Earth's orbit. The famous Earthrise photo was taken during this mission. Now you, I, I'll share a video with all of you, and this is one of the most famous audios, uh, which which is ever to be played. Now, all of you must know what this quote is. This is the quote uttered by Neil Armstrong, the first person to set foot on the moon. Neil Armstrong uttered that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. This, according to him, was totally unprepared and came to him on the, sp the spur of the moment. He was overwhelmed by the situation. He was the first living being to land on another planet, the another uh, celestial body, which was not the Earth. And Apollo 11 truly changed what space travel is today. Apollo 11 commercialized space travel, which means it, it brought space travel to everybody in the world. It was viewed by 450 million people around the world. It was the first majorly telecasted space event in the world, and uh, it was it was it was uh, defining in so many other ways apart from being the first, the first, and the first. Apollo Eleven also proved that the moon was not a hollow structure, and it was also a, 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 a rocky body just like Earth. It also demonstrated that humans could now set foot on another planet with a sufficient gravity and not be harmed except by the atmospheres and the pressure. The image on your right is the, is the left foot of uh, Commander Neil Armstrong, and that, and that will remain on, on the moon forever since there is no atmosphere or wind to blow it away. The image on your left is uh, the second man on the moon, Edwin Aldrin Jr., who stepped out, out on the moon on 20th of July, 1969. This mission was truly historic, and that is the American flag waving proudly as the first flag to be set on the moon. The American, uh, the American mission to the moon also had a special significance since they carried a plaque. Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon on July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind with the signatures of the three astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin, and Michael Collins. Um, Neil Armstrong was the mission commander Edwin Aldrin was the lunar module pilot, and Michael Collins was uh, the command module pilot. So, and it, it also had the, uh, the signature of the president at the time, Richard Nixon. This was, uh, this was, a plaque was put on the lunar module to show that uh, in case any aliens visited the moon, they would know that man's intentions were pure. They also carried a gold olive feather which symbolized peace, and uh, to uh, to commemorate the uh, the and to commemorate and mourn the accident of the Apollo one astronauts, they carried uh, a plaque or a, a badge symbolizing their 
uh, their sacrifice and left it on the moon. They also carried a silicon chip in case of advanced civilizations visiting them so that data could be transferred in a digital manner. And this is where Apollo 1 landed uh, on, on the Sea of Tranquility on July 28, 1969. The mission lasted for eight days, which, uh, which to, uh, six, days was, uh, six days of it was spent on the, the to and fro motion, which means uh, they went, they, the mission uh, to the moon required three days to go and three days to come back, even though it was on the most powerful rocket at the time. Now, we shall see the trajectory. So they launched on Cape Kennedy in the USA and they orbited around the Earth around two times and then they exited Earth orbit. After exiting Earth, Earth's orbit, they made a beeline for the moon. Then after two more, um, two more orbits around the moon, they chose a, a spot to land, which was already predetermined. And then they, they, they started to land, but disaster struck at the final moment. It seemed that the landing site was not ideal. There were a lot of bumps and cracks in, in the landing site, and it was deemed unsafe. So Neil Armstrong took uh, control of the module and piloted it to a safe distance and landed there. Luckily, uh, the mission turned out to be a success, as we all know. And they landed back uh, three days later and were national and were world heroes ever since. Everybody knows the story of Neil Armstrong and has heard of him at least once in their science books. But we shall look at one of the most successful failures in the world. Why do I say so? Why is this a successful failure? Well, he, uh, Apollo 13, which was two missions after Apollo 11, set out with the same intention to land on the moon. But unfortunately, the three astronauts who were on the, who were on the uh, mission noticed a problem midway through the flight. It seemed that an oxygen cylinder had burst. So, Midway through, through the mission over here, they noticed that an oxygen cylinder had ruptured in the service module over here. And um, the oxygen cylinder seemed to have ruptured because of a failing in the wire system. And that wire system had ignited the liquid oxygen. And that blew up one of the O2 uh, cylinders, which blew up the second one. And that tore a massive hole into the spacecraft. So the Apollo 13 astronauts had a problem on their hands. All their oxygen in the, uh, was in the command module. They had no oxygen with them left for their uh, left. So what, what would they do? Luckily, Houston, which was their ground command base, they, they determined that um, the, from the command module, uh, they must travel to the lunar module. The lunar module also has some oxygen, uh, has, has a little bit of oxygen with it required uh, so that they may land on the moon and come back up safely. So the astronauts with limited supply of oxygen landed and uh, transferred to the lunar module. They ejected the service module and used the lunar module as a lifeboat to come back to Earth safely. This was one of uh, the greatest saviors, uh, greatest saves in history. Even though there were uh, millions of kilometers, there, there were thousands of kilometers away from Earth and with no one uh, to help them, these three astronauts showed the courage and determination to come back to Earth safely. Now, Apollos 14, 15, 16, and 17 were pretty much similar in the sense that they did not do any, they did not achieve uh, so much remarkable. Apollo 14 uh, set out to do the things that Apollo 13 could not achieve. They conducted seismic experiments to determine whether moon's surface was moving, was geologically active, which means did the moon have earthquakes? But Apollo 15 had a more noble intention in mind. Apollo 15 set out to commemorate all the astronauts who had died. To your right, you can see a plaque that reads the name of the 14 astronauts and cosmonauts who had died, uh, till, uh, died till 1970, with, uh, which was the date when Apollo 15 was launched. So th that commemorated all those astronauts who had lost their lives and a small toy astronaut, a metal astronaut was placed on the ground to honor them. Apollo 15 also had another scientific uh, scientific experiment to prove. They had a hammer and a feather and they dropped them on the moon. So what do you think will happen? On earth, the hammer would fall first since you, you may think it's heavier, but the feather would float down slowly. But on the moon where there is no atmosphere, it showed that the hammer and the feather dropped at the same time, thus proving what Galileo had predicted over 500 years ago. Apollo 16 was 
was uh, was the first mission to introduce the lunar buggy which you can see here the lunar buggy was uh, was was brought to the moon in pieces so that it could be assembled there and um, driven there so that uh, driven there so that uh, a lot more surface of the moon could be explored it was the first mission it was the first uh, we could say it is the first car to be assembled on the moon and it is the first moon made uh, vehicle it was also the first human piloted craft on the moon and apollo 17 was unfortunately the last mission on to the moon it was the last mission to carry man to the moon and uh, in 1972 apollo 17 set out to uh, to go to the moon and uh, and perform experiments which would never be done again until 2024 apollo 17 came back and the astronauts uh, were considered heroes these are the uh, astronauts who who serve, who have gone to the moon or have taken part in the apollo missions uh, a total of 12 men have landed on the moon but in 2024 the artemis mission plans to change that the artemis mission plans to put the first woman on the moon so we can all be excited for that and hope that there are more things to come in the future thank you that was fantastic akshaj now let's welcome mirunalini for a short two two question quiz thank you Hello everyone, I'm Renan and I'll be conducting a short quiz. Which of the below is not a way of how a crater is formed? Your options are impact crater, volcanic crater, explosion crater, geofractal crater. You have 20 seconds to answer the question. Which of the below is not a way of how a crater is formed? Your options are impact crater, volcanic crater, explosion crater, geofractal crater. And the answer is geofractal crater. The next question is, which of the following is not a type of impact crater? Your options are simple crater, complex crater, wave crater, basin crater. Your 20 seconds start now, starts now. Your question is, which of the following is not a type of impact crater? Your options are simple crater, complex crater, wave crater, basin crater. And the right answer is wave crater. Thank you, and we should have a quiz a while later. Thank you, Marinalini, for the fact. Now, Akshay would be explaining how to imagine the moon and image the moon and
Okay. Hey guys, uh, my name is Akshay and I'm in the 11th grade and today I'll be teaching you guys how to image the moon. Now we've all observed the moon in the night sky. It's, it's a pretty common object we see at most places. Now, apart from observing the moon, how cool would it be if you actually capture the moon and keep it as a memory forever? Now, you might think you'd need, you know, a expensive equipment or a telescope of some sort but well, what if i tell you you don't it's such a simple process and doesn't require that much effort to get a good looking picture or doesn't need expensive equipment to get a good picture so today i'll be talking about how you can actually get a good picture of the moon so first of all you don't need a huge telescope or expensive equipment with tracking mounts or any of those things just need a good dslr or mirrorless camera and a decent lens so you can use any dslr or mirrorless camera and you, you have to use a decent uh, lens with a high focal ratio uh, high so basically it should be um, 300 millimeters is decent and you, uh, 600 is a sweet spot because the moon is quite small if you think about it and the higher the uh, focal length of your lens the larger it will appear and another factor would also be the um, sensor type if it's a full frame or a crop sensor so if it's a crop sensor it would appear larger on lenses uh, compared to a full frame now the procedure is quite simple what you do is you set up your telescope and point it at the moon and then switch to video mode. You know, it's quite controversial if you're shooting a photo, but I'll be explaining why we need a video. So switch it to video mode and you can start shooting. Now for the settings to shoot in, you don't need such fast um, aperture. You don't need a wide aperture. Since the moon is so bright in and itself, you can use anywhere from f5.6 to f8 with a, quite a low ISO because you don't want it to be too grainy since the moon is already bright. Now with those settings all set, we can start recording the moon. Now as for duration, you can keep going until the moon leaves your field of view, which is the part where you're seeing to the camera. If you have a tracking mount or something like that, you can keep going for quite a while, the more time you take the moon, the more data you have to get a more crisp image. So it depends, but usually one minute is decent and three minutes would give you a good image time, especially with lower focal length. It takes time for the moon to uh, leave the field of view. So once you've taken your video, it'll probably be in an MOV format or an MP4, whichever you have chosen for your output. Preferably, you can switch off compression for the video so you can have the maximum quality for your video. So I'll quickly share my screen and show you how the software side process will be done. Give me a moment. Okay, so I'm sharing my file explorer right now. So hopefully your video should be somewhat like this. Give me a moment.
So this is a preview of how your video should look like. It, it can be shaky, it doesn't matter. If there's wind or atmospheric disturbances, it will be present. But as long as you have the moon within sensor view, it should be fine. So this video, particular video is one minute and six seconds long. So it goes to the top and then it, it starts exiting the frame of view, field of view. So I stop the video. Now we have this video data, but I have a video, but I need a photo. Now here's where the fun part is. Using each frame from a video, like a video is nothing but a composition of different a number of images depending on frame rate so if the frame rate is 30 fps which stands for frames per second i have 30 images within one second of one second of video data so if i have one minute i'll have a lot of frames to work with now using data from each frame i can compound each data and create one super image with which has all the data from the video so this is this process is called stacking. Now to stack the data, first we have to clean it up a bit. Since we have a lot of redundant frames and parts where the moon goes out of view, we have to clean those up and you know remove all the unwanted stuff that will ruin the data so for that i'll be starting with a software called pipp planetary image pre-processing it's open source and it's free software and you can use it too you can download it right now on the internet for free so what i'll do is i'll import my mov file into pipp you can either file open or you can add you can drag and drop onto the thing so once you have this in it's a video and it shows you how many frames you have so you can see it, it has 1652 frames so these uh, this frame count is the number of images i have in the video and it shows the uh, FPS count also, which is 25 frames per second. Now, what I do is there are green things here, which show optimized options for. So these are basically presets. Now, right now I have the moon. So I'll select solar slash lunar full disk since it's not an up close video of the moon. Now, once selected, it will show me some preset options. So if I move ahead to the processing options window here, there are a ton of options and the options highlighted in green are the ones already selected by the preset we have here. So you don't need to change much, but I'll be explaining the settings. You can leave gain and correction to one so it doesn't do much. If you want, if your uh, input is too noisy, you can enable median noise filter if you want, that's optional. But then since we are looking at the moon, we don't have much color data to work with. So we can remove artifacts like chromatic aberration, which is basically the light fringing in the edges, causing like blue halos to appear. So we can remove all those artifacts just by changing to monochrome, which is basically grayscale or black and white. So this uh, compresses the RGB color data into just black and white. So we have much better data to work with. Now, moving on to frame stabilization. We can select object slash planetary, which basically means the detection method used to detect what's on the screen, since the software needs to know what's there. And in object detection, we can, uh, the preset values are fine. And we choose to center the object in each frame so that the stacking software has an easier time stacking the data. And we'll crop it for good measure because the sent our field of view is pretty wide and the moon is a small portion of the whole video so if we crop it it'll be easier to process since we don't need to process all the black areas 
Now, if you can see this output frame window, this is what it will be looking like the software, what the software sees. So if I go ahead and click test detect threshold, which basically means the software's way to identify if something's in the frame or not. So it highlights what it thinks is the moon in red. So if you get this, uh, if you get your object as red and everything else grayed out, it's, it means you're good to go. If you don't, you can try changing the detection threshold by unselecting auto object threshold and you can uh, increase or decrease and keep testing until you get the moon selected in red. Now that's pretty much it in the processing and you can leave quality and animations in their presets. Now we only need to change one thing in our output section. Now this preset uh, directs us to a TIFF file. So a TIFF is basically a high quality image. And what this uh, output option is, is basically it will export the video as a, a series of TIFF images for the stacking software. But to make it easier, I'll just use an AVI format, which is a video format, which is high quality. And so I'll only have one file to work with instead of uh, a thousand images. So I'll just uh, change this to AVI. And AVI is also a form that most stacking softwares use. So I can go to the processing tab, the final one, and I can start the processing. Now to save time, I've already processed this particular data set before this uh, session to save time because this will take a minute or two. And if you have a larger file, it will take anywhere from 10 minutes to even an hour if you have more data. So my output file will be shown in file in the same file where the source video was. So let me show that real quick. So this is the file, this is the folder where my video was, the MOV file. And you see it here it has created a subfolder with the date and some numbering. So in here we have the AVI file, which is our final output. Now, if you compare this video's thumbnail with this, we can already see that it has done some cropping and centering within the frame. So if I open this real quick, We can see here that it has basically put the moon in the center of our view and it has stabilized it so it stays in the center and it doesn't drift apart. So if you notice, we can see that the time is a bit less, it's 56 seconds. So what it's done is it's eliminated some of the images that uh, it thinks is, you know, either some of the moon is lost, either it's cropped by the frame or it's too blurry. So it is cut out those redundant frames and it has left us with this video. Now we can work with this video in our stacking software. So what we have done now is just cleaned up our images for the stacking software. Now for stacking, there are multiple softwares which I can use, but for this uh, session, I'll be using something called auto stacker, which is also open source and free to use for windows. You can also use another software called Registax, but it's a, it's quite an old program and may not work well with Windows 10 features. So I'll be opening AutoStacker. You can download it right now for free on the internet. Last updated on 2018, so it should work fine. Now this is the auto stacker uh, window. First you open it. So I'll go ahead and click open. And I'll drag in my AVI file that Pip has created. So Now we can see it's loaded it in. 
and now in terms of image stabilization it's pretty much already stabilized with pip and it doesn't need much so in case of moon generally it's a good option to use surface stabilization for solar lunar and like deep sky recording but for the second option for planetary is good for planets but in this case since it's already stabilized good enough i can use planets since it's much easier to process with this but ideally you have to use surface stabilization so after i hit that you can keep the quality estimation and everything else in its defaults and hit analyze so what this does is it analyzes each frame and it calculates to see which frames to um, remove and it analyzes the quality of each frame since we have already used pip to remove most of the um, unnecessary frames this step won't be that helpful but this is the first step for the software to recognize each frame so once we have done this you can see a quality graph open up so this quality graph basically shows the number of images and its quality you don't have to fret too much about this you can just leave it as is you can use this data to see how many frames you want to preserve but it's not required for this tutorial now in terms of reference frame you can keep this at its default but in this option frame percentage to stack let's select 90% of the frames and let's give it 10% to remove which it thinks it's blurry so after this i have to align it now auto stack it opens up another window which can be seen here and in this you can select the zoom this is just a preview window so i've zoomed it out for now now what we have to do is stabilize the image so the stacking happens on the same place for each image so it the way this stacks is it uses alignment points so if i keep an alignment point on this crater for example since it's easily visible on each image it will find this crater and use that as a reference point but instead of manually selecting the alignment points we can automatically place the align point grid and let it do its thing now you see the grid around each thing is quite big so we can just reduce the size to like 24 since this image is pretty cropped already we can set it to 24 and hit the ap grid again yeah this is more ideal if you have a much larger image with a higher resolution you you can use larger ap sizes now you see it has produced 3000 alignment points automatically and it's pretty congested anyways so it's done a good job in selecting points it thinks that it has high contrast so you can leave it as it is if you want if the stacking doesn't work and you see the output image drift you can manually select points of high contrast with black and white and you can click on each point to place an to place an ap manually so a minimum of 30 alignment points would do but the auto align point placement is good enough anyways so coming back to the main window now since we have uh, selected the stabilizing we need we can go ahead and we have selected 90% of images to be stacked you can leave this default and it will save in the folder that already as the source file so uh, you see these advanced options drizzle basically what it does is while processing each image it increases the size of the image to 3 times processes it but the final image comes back to the default size this helps if the image is very small in case of like planetary nebulae or small planets but since this is a moon and it's a massive object we do not need drizzle because drizzle will take up a lot of um, resources and cpu power and it'll take like five times longer to stack so you can use drizzle if you have a such a small object you want to stack so all the options can be set at default and then we can go ahead and stack it so it goes through its process and starts doing its thing so first it gets a reference frame which it thinks which is the moon is in the center and pretty much everything is in the center so it's pretty fast in identifying that 
and now it aligns each frame to the reference frame so it in case we have not processed it with pip before since the moon will be in different places throughout the video what it does is it takes each frame and aligns it on top of the reference frame which is basically in the middle so we get all the images stacked on in the middle so this might take a while bear with me please Now, while it's processing, let me talk a bit more about our moon image we have taken. So you can see that this isn't a full moon, right? Now, the reason I haven't taken a full moon is because if you think about it, the moon reflects the sun's light because it doesn't produce its own light. Now, if the source of light is exactly on the face of the moon, which is basically a full moon, there won't be much contrast in the shadows of the crater right? because the light is coming head first. There won't be any shadows cast by the craters. So if it's a full moon, it'll be pretty dull and you won't get much details. Now, if it's taken during a gibbous phase like this, a waxing or a waning gibber, we have something called the terminator line, which is pretty straightforward. It means the black line that basically separates the light and the dark side of the moon. Now, most detail will be seen on the terminator line because that's the edge of where the sunlight is reflecting on the moon and causing the most number of craters to show. Now, this is easily visible in this image as you can see so many craters here. Now, the best face for the moon would probably be a waxing or a waning gibbous if you want a lot of details of the craters. But if you want a full disk of the moon, you can take it during a full moon, but you won't have much detail and it won't be that impressive to look at. Now, the size of the moon also depends since it doesn't orbit Earth in a circular orbit, it's slightly elliptical. So at some points, the moon can reach closer to Earth or farther than Earth. And ideally, you can image the moon when it's slightly closer which will appear like 7% larger in the sky. Okay, so it's almost done aligning. Now it will stack each image and this also might take a while. The better processor you have, the CPU, the faster the stack uh, is, stacking is done because stacking and alignment and all of that is highly, processor intensive to do calculations so since this is a laptop it takes quite a while Now, normally this process would take longer if I hadn't have processed it with PIP before. But since PIP has already done a good job in making the uh, moon into the middle of the frame and rejecting all the unwanted frames, the soft auto stacker is having a much easier time in processing it. So it's almost done. Now we'll just analyze the stack and it'll write the image to the output file. Okay, now that that's done, you can open the file, either going to file, show output directory or F and shortcut, but it'll save it in the same subdirectory you used for the source file as well. So let me really quick sh uh, shift to that. Now we can see this is the uh, source file and we have the folder as underscore p90 auto stacker. So here we have a TIFF file, which I've been talking about, which is a high quality image file. 
unlike PNG or JPEG, which is a compressed file format, this is a, a raw file format that doesn't exclude image data. So this is our final stack. Compared to the video and compared to this stack, our stack is much better. You can see a lot of details. You can see a lot of craters. But we can take this one step further, and it won't take much time at all. So now I've, I've also mentioned a software named Registax for stacking. But the only reason I haven't used that is because it's pretty buggy since it's very old software. and works with Windows 7 or Windows XP, for example. So one good thing about Registax is it has something called wavelet processing, which basically brings out detail which is hidden in the image. So now you can normally do this with uh, an image manipulation program like Photoshop and you know increase contrast and stuff. But Registax is pretty easy to do. It's just you know changing some sliders and some options. So I'm going to do that right now. So I hope Registax doesn't crash while doing this, but so this is the Registax window. It's V6, which is obviously the latest, but it's pretty old. Now, what you can do is open up the TIFF file from AutoStacker and drag it into this. And it'll ask you if I want to stretch intensity. I can just hit no for that. And it's it uh, knows that the image is in black and white. So I'll tell it to process in black and white. Now, since this is a stacked image, we don't need to do the stacking process which, because we have done it in auto stack it already. So over here, we have to enable show full image if you want to see the whole image. And we can also hit show processing area. And now this creates like a view box. So you can see these different layers with different sliders. We have six sliders. Now, this is the wavelet processing. Now I've enabled the show processing area option. So whatever changes I do to this will be shown here. It won't affect the whole image. So layer one is basically the bulk of the image processing. So I can just increase the slider and immediately it increases the contrast. So going to secondary and uh, tertiary layers, I can drag it, but not as much as I would do for the first layer. But I like to um, increase the sixth one quite a bit which in which increases the subtle highlights a lot so now you see it's done those changes in this small box but to do it for the whole image we can hit the do all button now immediately we see the moon's much sharper and the craters are much more pronounced now the moon right now is in black and white so we do not need to worry about color management but in case you didn't process it in black and white you can make it into a gray tone by using the RGB align and RGB balance tool. Since we have it in black and white, we won't do that. But the moon is slightly bright. So with this contrast and brightness slider, which is the second one, we can slightly decrease it just a bit. And then we can hit the do all button again. So it does it for the whole image. A bit too much. Yeah. Much better. So now once you're happy with this image, we can hit the save image button and save it to the same directory. Okay, now that that's done, it has saved it and we can view the file. So here's the final file. You can see the craters are much more easily visible and more detail is shown. And you can see the uh, brightness around the edges of the moon is gone. And now this is a much more high quality image than what we had before. So let me really quick compare what we had at the start with what we have right now.
so this is our final file and let me open up the uh, original one So this is our original video file. Now you can see the, you can't see much detail and it's very noisy. You can see the red and green dots everywhere. You can see the blue fringing around the edges of the moon. And all of this is gone and processed to get the final image. So this is it for me. And it's as simple as this. You don't need any fancy equipment or high profile you know, camera equipment. It's just as simple as taking a video of the moon and putting it through some software with automated, automated and default values anyways. So it, it can be done by anyone is my point. It doesn't take a lot of effort to make a good image of the moon and maybe do this and impress your friends. So that's it from me and thank you guys. That was great information and thank you for the hard work, Akshay. Now, as Akshay has spoken, now that Akshay has spoken, sorry for that inconvenience. Now that Akshay has spoken, we have Miranalini for two questions now. Thank you. Hello everyone, Mainali here again. I'm here to conduct another short quiz, which will consist of three questions. Your question is, which Apollo crews were quarantined upon returning to Earth? Your options are Apollo 11, 12, and 14, Apollo 8, 10, and 13, Apollo 15 and 16, Apollo 17. The 20 seconds starts now. Which Apollo crews were quarantined upon returning to Earth? Your options are Apollo 11, 12, and 14, Apollo 8, 10, and 13, Apollo 15, and 16, Apollo 17. And the right answer is Apollo 11, 12, and 14. The next question is, how many pounds of lunar material did the Apollo missions bring back to Earth? Your options are about five pounds, nearly 80 pounds, over 800 pounds, about 100 pounds. How many pounds of lunar material did the Apollo missions bring back to Earth? Your options are about five pounds, nearly 80 pounds, over 800 pounds, about 100 pounds. And the right answer is over 800 pounds. Your last question is, which mission was the first to see the dark side of the moon? Your options are Apollo 7, Apollo 8, Apollo 9, Apollo 10. Which mission was the first to see the dark side of the moon? Your options are Apollo 7, Apollo 8, Apollo 9, Apollo 10. And the right answer is Apollo 8. Thank you. Thank you, Mirnan. Now, Guru should talk about solar and lunar eclipse. Please carry on, Guru. Hi, I'm Guru, and I'm here to talk about eclipses. Give me a moment, I'll just share my screen. I hope you guys can see it. First of all, we're going to talk about a solar eclipse. What is a solar eclipse? A solar eclipse is when the moon blocks the sun's rays. So you might wonder, isn't the sun larger than the moon? 
So how can the moon even block the sun's rays? It is because the sun is 400 times larger than the moon and the distance between the earth and sun is 400 times larger than the earth between the distance between the earth and moon. So in our sky, the sun and the moon are about the same size. So it is possible in our perspective for the moon to block the sun. There are two parts of a solar eclipse, the umbra and the penumbra. The umbra is the darker, smaller region of the moon's shadow and the penumbra is the lighter shadow or the blockage of the light. In the penumbra, a small amount of light is bled through the moon, whereas in the umbra, none of the light um, passes through. There are three types of the solar eclipse. First of all, we have a total solar eclipse. A total solar eclipse only takes place in the umbral region, where there is no sunlight at all. Secondly, we have a partial eclipse. When the moon is there in the umbral and the penumbral region, it blocks partially and it lets some of the light to pass through. And lastly, we have an annular eclipse. And this takes place because the moon is closest to the earth in one point and it is farthest to the earth in another point. When this happens, when the moon is farthest to the earth, the annual solar eclipse takes place because the moon is not large enough to cover the total sun. But this only happens in the umbral region. This is supposed to be a total solar eclipse and it is not a total solar eclipse because of the moon's size. Let's say you are in a place and you experience a total solar eclipse. You will only be able to see the total solar eclipse in the same place after 400 years. As a matter of fact, the moon is moving away from the earth. It is moving away in a rate of 1.43 inches per year. It, this might not look like a lot, but in, an, in another billion years, we will never be able to see total solar eclipses at all. This is because the moon will be smaller than the sun. This, the moon will become way too small to cover the total sun. Now that we are done with the solar eclipse part, we are going to talk about lunar eclipses. So what is a lunar eclipse? Lunar eclipse is when the earth falls in between the sun and the moon. When will it happen? It happens when the earth falls in between the sun and the moon and it casts a shadow of the sun on the moon which makes the moon red and we'll talk about it why it is red. So this only happens when in a full moon. So you might, you might wonder why isn't every full moon and lunar eclipse? That is because the orbit of the moon is tilted. So only when the moon, earth and the sun come in the same view, line of view, a total solar eclipse takes place or else a, sol a lunar eclipse won't take place at all. Uh, like the solar eclipse, we have an umbra and a penumbra in the lunar eclipse as well. Here the umbra is the darker shadow of the sun, earth and the penumbra is a region where some of the sun's rays are bled through. There are three types of lunar eclipses. First of all, we have the total lunar eclipse. This is when the moon falls in the umbral region of the earth's shadow. You might wonder why it is blood red. Because the blue and the green rays are refracted off due to the earth's atmosphere. And only the yellow and the red and orange rays are refracted into the moon due to, the, due to their higher wavelengths. Secondly, we have a partial lunar eclipse. This takes place when the moon falls in between the umbral and the penumbral region. This is when a very tiny part of the moon is blocked off and the other part is lit up. Last, we have a penumbral lunar eclipse. This is mostly not visible at all because this is way too subtle for your eyes to capture it. If you don't know there is a lunar eclipse taking place, you will never know it is a penumbral lunar eclipse because the amount of brightness reduction is very low. Let's say the moon is 100% brightness on a regular day. On a penumbral lunar eclipse, it's going to be 75% brightness at the maximum. This happens when the moon totally falls in the penumbral region, as the name suggests. So where can we observe a lunar eclipse? 
Unlike solar eclipses, which happen on specific regions, lunar eclipses can be observed on the night half of the Earth. The whole half Earth can observe a lunar eclipse on the same time. We have distant problems here. As the moon is moving away from the Earth slowly, it is inching very slowly in another billion years the same case is there with solar eclipses as well. In another billion years, we'll never be able to see lunar eclipses at all. Total lunar eclipses won't be possible because the lunar eclipses. total lunar eclipses won't be possible at all because the moon will become way too, way too big to fit into the umbral region of the Earth's shadow. Thanks. Wow, Guru, that was really fascinating. Now let's now let's welcome Srinivas on the lunar eclipse story. Hi, my name is Srinivas, and today I want to share to you about an interesting incident that occurred in the world famous Christopher Columbus's journey. I'm sure you all know about Christopher Columbus, and today I wanted to tell you something of a lunar twist in his journey. When Columbus left from Spain in his journey, he realized that the ships had a large shipworm infestation, which led him to abandon his other two ships and beach his two caravels in an island now known as Jamaica in the northern side of the island. The native people of Jamaica welcomed the crew and gave them food and shelter. Unfortunately, as days grew into weeks and weeks grew into months, the nourishing care of the native population diminished. It reduced to nothing. The people were not ready to provide their food for small trinkets and metallic belts offered in exchange. In the verge of starvation, Christopher Columbus came up with an ingenious idea. Christopher Columbus carried an almanac, which is a calendar of sorts, marking the astronomical events for some period of time, ranging from years to months. He noticed that there was a total lunar eclipse three days from now. With this in mind, he immediately met up with the native chief and told him that his god is angry that the chief has not supplied his crew with food, water, and shelter. He said that the god is going to remove the rising sun. The chief did not believe him. Of course, he did not believe him, but Columbus knew this was true as he read it in the almanac. Sorry for this technical issue, someone muted me. He said to the native people that the God is angry and is removing the rising sun. The chief did not believe him, but Columbus knew this was true as he read it in his almanac. The Jamaican people, Jamaican people panicked and screamed because in three days later, the black moon was going to come. But the chief still not, did not believe him. But exactly as he predicted it, three days later, the red moon came right when he predicted it. The chief begged Columbus to give the moon back in exchange for food, water, and shelter. Columbus said he needed 50 minutes to talk to the god. But it was actually, he knew that in 15 minutes, the blood moon was going to disappear. So he waited, he closed himself in his room and he waited for 50 minutes until the blood moon disappeared. The knowledge that Christopher Columbus carried around with him in, in, in the form of an almanac about the moon saved him from starvation. Maybe it is good to have an astronomical calendar lying around with you. Thanks and thanks for hearing this wonderful story.
Wow, that was great, Srinivas. Now Rishi will show some of his drawings. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Rishi and I'm going to show you a bunch of comics on the lunar eclipse and the moon. Uh, hope you all enjoy. One second. Okay, I hope you all can see. So this is actually one of the comics I've made. Uh, a long time ago, so it's pretty old. And this is related on eclipses and transits. It's not actually complete, but I'll explain the ex ec eclipses part to you. Um, so the comic's name is Hide and Seek, so pretty simple. So in, in the first slide, um, I basically start with a very simple explanation. Even planets can play hide and seek. It's not only children, everyone can play hide and seek. But Generally, scientists like to keep very special names for such uh, games. So instead of calling it hide and seek in space, they usually call it ec eclipses or transits. But now we're just going to look at eclipses. Uh, in the last, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you know what eclipses are, so I'm not even going to explain here. So let's just go to the next group. Uh, so, uh, so just look at the drawing. So eclipses occur when an object blocks another object. It's pretty simple, you all know this. It doesn't have to be the Earth and the Moon. It can be any, any object, any celestial body. Uh, so in, the, in this case, we are doing mostly on, you, you guys would have learned on the lunar eclipses. So there are two types of eclipses that occur with the Moon, Earth and Sun, which is solar and lunar. Um, so I've just drawn them with little people. And solar eclipse is pretty simple. I'll just explain it in one sentence. Um, the moon the moon's shadow falls on Earth, and in lunar eclipse, the Earth, you can see the Earth basically uh, blocks the moon. There are three types of lunar eclipse, uh, subcategories. Uh, there's the penumbral, the partial, and total. I'm sure all of you learned on all these uh, already from Guru. Uh, he, he might have explained it much better than I did. Uh, so the penumbral eclipse occurs when the moon crosses the penumbral shadow or the lighter shadow, as you can see here. Uh, the small circle is the moon, obviously, and you can see the lighter shadow, that's the penumbral shadow. There's not much difference in this eclipse. You don't generally see anything. It turns up very, it just turns darker a little bit. It's not even noticeable. So we'll move on to the next one. The next one has a bit more fame to its name. Now the partial eclipse. The partial eclipse is actually a mix of uh, the total eclipse and the penumbral eclipse. So what happens is the moon's kind of stingy. It comes in between both the shadows comes between the umbral and the penumbral shadow. So the part of the moon that's in the umbral shadow is, uh, is covered. So you won't, you generally won't be able to see it. It'll look like, uh, you know, it'll look like a gibbous or something like that. And the rest is not, you, it also has the little darkness from the penumbral shadow, but it's again, barely noticeable, but uh, the partial eclipse is, much um, it it has more you can actually see that it's an eclipse or not and the next one so the total lunar eclipse is actually strange uh, ignore the sad joke so the total lunar eclipse happens when the moon is completely in the umbral shadow and it's completely blocked so when the moon when the moon is in the total total eclipse, something strange happens. It turns red. So now I'm not going to explain about how it turns red. I'm pretty sure you all learned about this, and I just showed these comics to so hopefully you understood what's going on. I hope I can show more to all of you later, but that's all for me. Thank you, and hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Rishi. Your comics are fun and informative. 
Thank you, uh, Cyrus. So uh, thank you all. I think it was a wonderful session. All of you put in a lot of effort at short notice. I hardly gave you a few days of time to prepare and you guys have prepared for about two hours and each of you did a wonderful job. But before we end the session, of course, unfortunately, we could not see the moon today uh, because the weather uh, is, is pretty bad. I mean, it's been pouring uh, through the day across the state, I mean, across the city in Coimbatore and parts of Kerala. It's likely to continue for the next few days. But nevertheless, uh, we have full moon coming up in the next few days. So once the weather clears up, uh, please look up. And as we celebrate uh, the uh, International Observe the Moon Night as organized and so in support of uh, the event conducted by NASA, and we are proud to have uh, registered to host an event and our kids did a wonderful job. I mean, before we end, I would like to show you some images uh, of some of the eclipses that we as uh, Astronomy Club, we have taken uh, over the past several years. And some of these images and, and contributions were from the students themselves whom you listened to. So let me share uh, them quickly. So just a minute, I'm trying to show uh, you a couple of images before we sign off. So uh, if you remember, uh, Rishi was talking of Rishi and Guru, they were talking about the penumbral uh, eclipse and how it's sort of very difficult to observe it uh, uh, being it's just part passing through uh, the lighter part of the shadow, if you may call it, uh, uh, cast by the earth, the moon is moving through the lighter part of the shadow. And of course, it is possible to observe, it's not noticeable to the naked eye, but your cameras with your right settings, like Akshay was talking about imaging the moon, if you image it, you could actually observe a, a small difference uh, in the here if you see in this there are two images it was taken 2020 by the way on jan 10 and jan 11 the uh, intervening night on jan 10 so you can see the lower part of the moon it's slightly darkened than the uh, in the image above so this is the penumbral eclipse that you th this is the level of uh, change in the brightness that you can possibly observe and that's the difficulty in observing the penumbral eclipse nevertheless we can claim that it is passing through the shadow of the earth so it is an eclipse uh, and the, there are other images that i can show you which is the solar eclipse that again uh, this was shot on december 26 2019 again as, as part of the astronomy club we had organized a public outreach program uh, in in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, delhi planetarium uh, nehru planetarium in delhi and uh, of course this was one of the images that we were able to click as part of the uh, you know, annular ring of the so-called ring of fire eclipse and there is another eclipse uh, again it happened in 2020 which i'm sure all of you were aware of as well it's another ring of fire eclipse that happened uh, to be uh, visible from the northern india and this is another image taken by one of our club members uh, who was in Dehradun at that time who was able to capture this beautiful ring of fire eclipse or uh, that you see on the screen and there is another uh, video that you can see the ring of the fire eclipse and uh, I, I think the content is for some reason not available but yes so pretty much uh, that is uh, all from our side uh, we're sorry that we could not show you the moon but nevertheless i'm hope i hope that we have given you a lot to think about learn and uh, try things on your own like imaging the moon and we'll connect again soon uh, with some other events and next time when the skies are clear and the moon is up in the sky we will definitely go live and we will show you the live views of the moon. Unfortunately, those of you in Paimato and uh, in and around, you know it's been the weather has been pretty bad. So thank you for understanding that. And uh, with that, we sign off. And uh, good, uh, have a good uh, uh, full moon. Hopefully, in the coming days. Thank you all. Now, I shall. You can always play back the video anytime if you want to uh, uh, learn about these things that we discussed today.